that's the first test we're going to do is a quick pattern like that. Which, speaking of, we are nearing now the end of chapter two. So our first test will be either a week from Thursday or two weeks from today. I'm hoping to get it done in the next three days. Everything we need to do is going to be a week from Thursday. And I only have one of the questions picked out right now. It's very simple. Uh, can it be done in class? So I'm hoping to do it in class, so, but I will have definitive information for you um, next Tuesday, both whether or not it's Thursday and whether or not it's Tuesday. Is that also going to give us the old exam? What? Is that also going to give us the old exam? Possibly. There's a chance I'm going to use one of the questions off here. Um, but I will at least give you something to practice. Some practice stuff. Now, uh, Jared's made a request that I give you homework answers, proofs for homework answers, which I'm happy to do. I just have to find the time to write them up. Um, it is time consuming. So I will do that as best as I can. At least for right now, um, I will take the bigger problems, the ones that I perceive that are more difficult on the homeworks, and I'll try and get those out as quickly as I can. Yeah. Um, also, don't try and find me on Tuesday with some digits. I'm not here, or I won't be answering my door unless you're in really important, like a D. So we can use a quarter voice and then play it. What'd you say? So we can use a quarter voice and then play it at the door. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Do you want me to control that? Mm -hmm. Control what? Him? Oh, the remote. I thought you were pointing to David. I'm like, really? You control the David? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, so today is actually, granted, <laughs> this is his point of view, uh, one of the most fun days we'll have in this class. It, is, it covers one of the most interesting concepts. We're going to get into full general relativity, which is really cool Yippee! stuff. I think it's neat. Um, and so, some special, some courses don't even cover general relativity, but because math is stupid complicated. Um, we are going to simplify it and only cover the, the tip of the iceberg and cover it mostly from a conceptual standpoint. Which is to say that we can't do anything. Alright, first, last time we talked about the energy function. We said that the total energy of an object is going to be equal to uh, our gamma u times mc squared. We also said that our momentum equation, our new momentum equation, can be given as gamma u times mc. Now, we can combine these two equations to give us something. I'll picture it in silent. Okay. E squared is equal to E squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. A whole bunch of squared terms. Okay. And this is a much more useful equation to us because it encompasses everything. We can say that the energy of the particle is now given to us as this, which has which doesn't have u in it. Now, that's only kind of partially true. When I say that it doesn't have u in it, u being the velocity of the object within a reference frame, uh, why is that only kind of true? Obviously, there's no u written there, but where is u hiding? Momentum. In the momentum. But u is not always hiding in the momentum. And the reason being, we're going to get here in a minute to talk about massless particles. So this equation can dominate both massless particles and massless and massful particles, I suppose. So massless particles with the second term dropped out. Yeah, exactly. And we're about to show that. So your homework, which I swear to you is only like three lines, is to show that this and this, these two equations, will get you to this equation. Only two lines. You just got to get rid of you. It's not terribly complicated. <coughs> Um, you only, your homework for this week is only two questions. So, one that's a derivation and one that's just a plug-in chug off of stuff in general relativity that we're learning today. So I figured I'd take it easier on you guys a little bit. Alright, so, that moves us to the next topic, massless particles. What's the number one massless particle and pretty much the only massless particle we usually discuss? Photon. 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 Okay. Light. So, massless particles. Wait, are there other massive particles? Yes, but none that we're talking about here. I mean, this is both a dot and an error in the wall. So that we're talking I'll be spelled math wrong. Hmm? I like it. It's the same thing. Really? <laughs> no, I wouldn't believe it. All right, exactly as you're perceived. Um, we're guessing. We could say for this equation, p e squared is equal to p squared t squared because the math is just going to zero for all of our massless particles, which can be simplified to say that g equals p, c times c. The energy of a massless particle is just equal to its momentum times the speed of light. 
Now, the first question that asks, uh, that is logical to ask, is if it is a massless particle, how the hell does it have momentum? Now, we've said this, or you might have heard this before um, in classes previous to this. I mentioned this at 22.12. I say that, yes, photons are massless, but they have momentum. You've probably heard physicists say that before. They can transfer momentum. A photon can hit something and give it momentum. How is this possible? Now, you guys are finally in the position to answer that. When is the only way that that's possible? Because it's massless at the speed of light? Yes, it starts moving towards the speed of light. Let's look at the momentum equation here for a second. We've got mu u is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus uh, u, u squared over c squared. Now, as this, as a particle starts moving and approaching the speed of light, this becomes what? What does mu u go to? One. No. Really close to zero. Oh. Not any above. Keep looking. <laughs> what does mu u? Okay. So. U approaches C, what happens to mu U? Infinity. Oh. Look at this. Oh, one with one divided by zero. Oh, my God. Sorry, did I phrase that confusingly? I thought yes. you meant like the denominator of your point. Gotcha. No, the whole mu U. Yeah. So mu U is going to infinity, and while this happens, at the same time as the mass is going towards zero. So we have an indeterminate function here. We've got infinity multiplied by zero times C. And all we have to know is that that doesn't mean that that is equal to zero. That you can have a definitive uh, momentum associated with this. So in the next chapter, chapter three, we're actually going to study nothing but the photon. We'll get into this more. So yeah, what do you got? Awesome. Oh, sorry. Well, he had his hand up. To say. Okay. I can't say that. What do you got? Um, so this is one of the reasons why the you know, things can't go beyond the speed of light, correct? Um, no, the, you always hear the phrase that we say that things can't go faster than the speed of light because they become infinitely massive, right? It isn't actually true. What ends up happening is, all right, if we do a plot here of, okay, we'll do a plot of U, and we're going to do a plot of momentum. No, this is one of the graphs that's already in there, but we can, we can talk about it. As you start approaching U, so your momentum it's going to literally go up for a given mass, okay? Because you're going faster, so your momentum being just mass times velocity normally increases. This keeps happening until your U gets to a point where the speed of light, and what ends up happening is you go up like this, and this takes off. Your momentum goes towards infinity because your new U goes towards infinity. So one of the ways that we say that we know that nothing can move with mass enough uh, to move at the speed of light is the fact that the momentum required to move it increases uh, as a function of um, speed towards infinity moving over here. Now, also we can say that the energy is true. If the momentum goes up to infinity, then the energy required to accelerate something with infinite momentum becomes infinite. So that is slightly a misnomer, what it said before, that it is impossible to uh, accelerate something to the speed of light that has mass, um, it's because it gains momentum, which is mass is a function thereof. But to be specific, you need to include that. Does that answer that? So essentially, you would need infinite energy. Infinite energy to accelerate something that has now gained infinite momentum. Yeah. And that's the reason that it can't happen. Okay. So, all right, Jared, what do you got? So, how would we be able to calculate the momentum that's more fast? How do we handle this? Yeah. We wait to chapter three. Oh, okay. So it's kind of slow. Yeah. No, not yet. So, um, and th this is the, the whole subject of chapter three. What happens to the energy? How do we deal with the momentum? How do we quantify the momentum transfer when photons collide with something? Because we can see that the energy results of it. And so we can backwards figure out what the momentum necessarily is. That is impressive. There's only four. Yeah, but I don't think I've heard. You know, it's funny thing is I've heard legends of your sneezes. I don't think I've ever witnessed them. <laughs> you heard legends. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody described you as like a mouse being tickled or something like that. What did someone say? I forget what it was, but they're just the repetition. What machine gun? Yeah, something like that. There was a mouse involved in the analogy. I don't remember what it was. Who was this? I honestly don't remember. I'm not making that up. All okay. right. So next, uh, what was I gonna say? Oh, the idea, now we do have another problem. 
Okay, there's two things. If there's an infinite amount of energy that's required to accelerate something that has an infinite amount of momentum, um, that energy has to be applied in a way. How do we apply energy to accelerate something? Newton had something to do with this for forces. So the idea that force equals mass times acceleration kind of falls apart when we talk about massless particles. Now, this is not necessarily a problem, um, except for the fact that the equation says that this is um, doesn't work. What we basically come to the idea of is that this grand equation that the F net equals MA, which I spend all of the intro classes saying this dominates your life for the, the, the two thirds of the course, is incomplete. That is our assumption at this point. That just like the energy equation, and just like the momentum equation, this is incomplete and doesn't describe things that are either really small or really fast. So, um, we don't have an answer for this, or at least not to my knowledge that we have an answer. This goes back into coming up with a great unifying theory of explaining what are we missing here and how can we apply this to uh, massless particles. So once we explain that, we explain everything? Um, not necessarily. This is, there's lots of different things. So when we're trying to figure all this stuff out, when we're trying to unify everything, you get string theory and some of these advanced things, they're like, okay, we don't get this, we don't get this. In fact, the only thing we do get um, is electromechanical energy and forces. Coulomb's law seems to be the only complete system, Maxwell's laws. But we try to combine it to the strong force, which we kind of get. Um, it's really good glue. That's how I always describe it. And you get weak forces and then the gravitational force. The gravitational force is a real pain in the butt, which we'll get into today. Um, trying to put all of this stuff together to say that the rules here um, should apply everywhere else. Just like Newtonian's equations. You guys have now seen the first problem. Somebody comes up with a set of equations, and then we go to something advanced, like making stuff move faster, all the equations fall apart. We need more advanced equations. Obviously, we're not going to go back to 2201 and start teaching momentum with this gamma u form and make them calculate the, the fact that this is 1.0000001 every time and just tell them, well, in two classes, that'll make sense. You sure? Uh, oh, that'd be great. Is there any issue as it is open? What? Is there any issue as it is? Uh, probably, yeah. I'm definitely the heart of the uh, yeah, I was going to say that's the rule, but no, let's push the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you, oh, do you hear my explanation on one day? Do you hear my explanation on one day? Like, do you actually need to learn physics, or do you actually need to pass physics? Well, I, I don't think that's fair. I don't want to be that, that harsh. Okay, so, do 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 F equals MA is incomplete. Oh, why does that even matter? Where does this come from? Forces. How are forces related to momentum? Give me an equation that's, that involves F and P. Ah, I believe. Ta da. Close. Thanks. Alright. Give me an equation that involves force and momentum. Come on. Remember this whole idea of impulse? That hits the ball. So is it an inertia equation, correct? What do you got? Just force over time? Close. Think about the units. Let's go with that. We've got kilogram meters per second squared. And what is our units for momentum? Kilogram times meters per second. So divided by time. No. Oh. Times time. Multiplied by time. There you go. Yep. Okay. And then we say the F average. We said divide both times, actually. Oh, I meant multiply the first time. Divide the second time was what I meant. <laughs> Gotcha. All right. But well, what you meant the first time is correct. So we said that F average times delta T is going to be a change in momentum. So we used to have these graphs where we had F and we had a change in time. And we would, if you're in algebra base, we did nice things like this that were squares. We integrated that. If you were in calculus space, we did ugly, ugly things and we made you integrate them. So we could say that this is also integral of force times delta T. It's going to give my momentum final minus my momentum initial. Now, why does this matter? Well, the reason being is that we, if we're going to argue that these photons have a certain amount of momentum, we need to be able to integrate the force that is applied to them. The force coming back from this mass times acceleration is incomplete. So that's where we need to you know, tie this back together and fix that. Now, the funny thing is, that being gone, that little piece is really small in the scheme of other things that we're worrying about. It doesn't really stop us from doing anything else. All we know is that that needs to be fixed. At some point, somebody should go around fixing that. So, 
earn yourself a Nobel Prize pretty easily, probably in physics, just for you know completing that equation. You're probably going to say plus something else, tiny. You know, maybe just write plus tiny and then submit that and see if that goes all the way. Can we do this with the math, with math knowledge and physics knowledge we know now? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Einstein invented physics. He didn't have any previous knowledge. He just invented it. So, <laughs> he just he just heard it. Invented. Are these odd thoughts? I'm sure it's worth I was trying to explain that because Joe's just sitting there bugging me. He's like, You spend a lot of time prepping for modern. I'm like, Yeah, well, you know, I'm kind of supposed to be able to repeat and understand all of Einstein's equations, and I don't. So, I do the best I can. Who's Joe? Huh? Jones. Jones was asking you oh. that. Okay, so this stuff is not too bad though. Now we're going to talk about a couple of equations that we have seen before. F12 equals capital G M2 over R squared. Now this is Newton's gravitate law of gravity. Gravitational law. I don't know. Okay. Now, capital G is a universal constant as far as we know. Now we also showed that at some point. In whatever class you're in, that capital G times Me over Re squared being the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth, which is 7.8 meters per second squared. And, and that's why we can simplify this to say that the force of gravity is equal to this 9.8, which, where did it come from? There's the answer. Now, so we then started to simplify this equation to say that f of g equals a g times m. Now here under near Earth's surface, we just say that we've got the mass of the Earth, and then we say that there's the mass of the object, mass of whatever we're interested in. Now, we also have another equation that we were just talking about, f max equals mass times acceleration. This is a more general equation that this is the total forces added together are going to equal the mass of the object times its acceleration. Now here's the confusing part. These masses don't necessarily have to be the same thing. Now what do I mean by that? This idea right here, this governs everything. This says we have a car that has a certain amount of mass, and we want to push it, we want to speed it up. This is what is known as the inertial mass. The heavier the car, the harder that I have to pull it, or push it. Let me explain. If I have this desk right here, and I want to push this across the table, it has a certain amount of mass, so it makes it harder for me to push it. So given, for a given amount of force, it's going to accelerate based on that inertial mass. Simultaneously, this table is being pulled down to the Earth. There's an attractive force between this table and to the Earth. Now we say that that is also a function of this table's mass. Nothing says that those two properties have to be the same thing. In other words, think about it this way. It could be that the difficulty of me pushing across the table is due to the fact that the table's brown. Okay? It's a property of the object. Now we're saying that it's, it's inertial mass, something that it has. And or vice versa. The way that two things were attracted to each other, we can say that the universe has said, this is square, so it gets really attracted to large round objects. If it was round, it wouldn't be attractive. It, I mean, it's, it's a stupid way to think about it. But the point being is this concept of we've seen that the, this relation of this pushing this direction and that pulling that way are both based on this same concept, mass, and we're saying that both of those masses are the same. They might not be. Okay, so we're going to call this our gravitational mass, and this we're going to say is our inertial mass. They could be two different things. So if we want to talk about our F net, or acceleration of an object, an acceleration of an object we say is equal to our F net divided by our inertial mass. Everything you learned was wrong. Uh, I have a question. What did you say? Surprise. Yeah, what do you got? Explain that again. I don't like getting where everything was wrong for it. Um, I think it's been about like two seconds. And you wanna. Um, the fact that we say that two things are attracted to each other, we say it's based on the mass. The, re the reason that the moon orbits the Earth is because of its mass. Now, what if it was because the fact that the moon was gray that it orbits okay. the Earth, or something ridiculous like that? So that same property, we also say, 
is how difficult it is to accelerate something. And we're tying those two things together. We're making assumptions. We're making assumptions that both of those quantities, as we measure them, are the same. Now, the book makes a comment here that uh, experimental uh, determination has shown that one part and uh, one in times 10 to the 12th, basically as high as we can possibly record things, um, has shown that these two quantities are the same. In other words, we record how fast something's attracted to it and we record how hard it is to push. And do, do those give us the same answers for mass? As far as we can tell, yes. The problem is, there's nothing in physics that says those two masses have to be the same thing. They could be two different things. In other words, the inertial mass might be an intrinsic property where the gravitational mass might have something to do with how fast it's moving. It could be relativistic. One of these could have an extra component to it. Obviously, they're closely related. They're not necessarily the same. So, what so, happens if they are different? Okay, we're getting there. So, the acceleration equals F net over the inertial mass. Now, in the event that something is in free fall, it's falling towards the Earth, the only force that's acting on it is the force of gravity. So I can simply put the force of gravity here, and I can say that this is going to be equal to AG MG over MI. So the acceleration, the inertial acceleration of an object, is equal to the gravitational acceleration of an object in free fall uh, multiplied by its gravitational mass divided by its inertial mass. If these are the same, then obviously that equals 1, and we're saying that this thing accelerates towards the ground at 9.8 meters per second. It's not always the same, or we don't know that it's necessarily the same. Okay, so here's where Einstein comes in. All right, Einstein says... Okay, here, we've got a man falling in an elevator. We took an elevator out um, on a plane, uh, 747, and not hopefully Malaysian Air flying, and we kicked the whole elevator out of the plane. Now, this object, this guy is falling. He's got a ball inside the airplane. He tosses the ball upright. Now, he is falling towards the earth, and the ball is falling towards the earth. Okay? So inside, he's going to feel weightless. That's what we're going to say. It's going to move around. Okay, so we're saying he's accelerating downward at g, or the acceleration due to gravity. Now, second object. This will start to make sense in a little while, I told you. So just bear with me for a little while. So, we've got Anna. Anna always has the cool things. Anna's out in space. She's on her spaceship, and she's in the middle of nowhere. Her acceleration is equal to zero. Her velocity is equal to zero. Now, from this point of view, she's sitting there, and the ball is also floating. Okay? So, as far as we can tell, any experiment that you would run inside this box, inside this elevator, and I do mean any experiment, should have the same effects as an object way off in the middle of nowhere, Nowhere near any planets or anything like that that have gravitational pull on it, so that this person is floating as well. But it doesn't. Well, we don't know. Here's the thing. So, the idea being is that, as far as we know, we think that this gravitational mass is the same thing as the inertial mass, right? So, now we're going to try and prove this in, in the reverse. Let's assume they are. If they are the same, and we want to go with that principle, then we have to say that this system is identical to this system, and it doesn't matter even though that that person's in an accelerated reference frame. Okay, it's actually pulling down towards the earth. So that doesn't feel like those other objects. Sorry. What do you mean? Like, you said, like, you don't feel gravity, right, in an elevator? Yes, yeah, so he just feels like he's weightless. Like, to so it's the same down. thing in the ship, right? Exactly, because right. he doesn't feel anything either. If you're in an enclosed space and you can't tell what's going on, it's the equivalent. David says you're waiting to test this since you're not really sure what they're acting on anything. No, no, we, you can test this. So yeah. how can we, so, so your velocity is always changing between the reference points. Are we doing that kind of thing again? Yes, we're going to get there where the velocity is changing. And by how much. But right now, we're saying within these, we're saying that neither thing's moving. This is why we're moving into the concept of general relativity, okay, as opposed to special relativity, where it's complicated. Now, this leads us to the principle of equivalence. Okay? So I'm not going to write this all out in the board. But the idea is simple. 
It says, the form of each physical law is the same in all locally inertial frames. So this is a little bit larger than Newton's um, laws. Okay, so this is written for you on page 45, right in the center of the page. Newton's law, or sorry, have Newton's, Einstein's law of equivalence. The form of each physical law is the same in all locally inertial frames. Now, this is the case where this is falling and this is standing still. If this is true, then mg must equal mi, if we can prove that all experiments in these two cases are identical. In other words, and let's see, this is the reason why. I can say that if I push this ball in space, it is still going to take a certain amount of force. It has a certain amount of inertial energy, inertial mass, as we say. And I can push it, and it's going to have some acceleration. It's going to go across to the other spacecraft. The second I let go of it, my impulse has stopped, it will then, whatever speed I've tra or accelerated up to, it will then go across the spacecraft at that constant velocity, the final velocity. Okay, now according to this, in this case, we'll have the exact same situation as we're falling. Everything's falling together. This is being accelerated downward with gravity. If I grab this ball and I throw it, I will be adding some velocity to it, and it should move across the box at the exact same final velocity that this does. If, in fact, our inertial mass and our gravitational mass are the same thing. Everything seem okay so far? I know this sounds ridiculous, but we're building to something where all of this makes sense and then we'll write something down and all of a sudden it's not going to make sense. That's why we have to accept all these postulates to begin with. So right now we're basically accepting mass is mass and that these two situations, we think everything should be identical physics-wise. Okay? Alright. Downward. Okay. This is entirely the basis of general relativity. Is this... Uh, principle of equivalence. Now, it doesn't seem like a big deal yet, but it is. So, there's two things in here that we're going to try and uh, avoid. When taking this, if any of you guys take this at a grad level, uh, mathematical tensors. In fact, you have to take an entire math course just for physicists, usually, just to be able to do any of the advanced physics. And you learn all about tensors and other areas of stuff. And it's also differential geometry, which is really good, since I'm guessing that nobody has had that uh, in here. Um, and I haven't even had it in 10 years. Uh, we will avoid that. Your book does a wonderful job of explaining this stuff. Is that like different equations on steroids? What? Is that like different equations on steroids? Yeah, we'll avoid that. That's a good way to put it. And tensors, anybody know what a tensor is? Uh, three and four dimensional vectors. I'm sorry, not three. Four, five, nine, ten dimensional vectors. So it, it is a way to describe things in four and five space instead of three space. So it gets terribly complicated. Yes? We kind of did talk about it, but we changed it a little bit in calc three. Well, yeah, because once you get to the concept of you want to include time, the idea today is what we're going to try and talk about is I'm going to try and prove to you, um, if I haven't already in special relativity, that time and space are very closely linked. It's actually two sides of the same coin. We've talked about that with the spacecraft moving different directions. And the fact that a photon sees itself traveling everywhere instantly. It is everywhere instantly from its point of view. Um, this is even more so in general relativity. So to describe anything, you have to describe it in the three spatial coordinates, x, y, and z, but also in time. So right there, you have a, oh, a fourth dimensional tensor you need to describe. All right, I'm, we're not going to worry about that right now. First topic, the topic that we're going to talk about today is something known as the gravitational redshift. Okay, gravitational redshift, how does this work? All right, let's get our two spacecraft going here. This is a person. Oh. That doesn't look like a person. I thought there was a pretty good person on their knees looking over a ledge. Okay. Wait. This is a light bulb drawn very quickly. Right, yeah. it's just hard. So they're on a spaceship. Go on. on a spaceship. Going up. Okay. Now, we are going to say that there is, I'm going to say that this is at time equals zero. Light goes off here. How much time does it take? The spacecraft is going up. Okay, 
it's accelerating with some a upwards. How much time does it take the light to get to the person from the person's point of view? So h is the length. Of the so h is length. H is length. H is the rest length between the ladder and the light source. Now, what can you tell me about the amount length of time that it's going to take this light to reach the person? And how do you know? The distance traveled. What about the distance traveled? That's not a time. I need time. As long as it takes the light to travel that distance. Okay, which is what? Say again? A times A for velocity. What's A? A is the acceleration. You're on to something here. What is the first equation and the one we use 90% of the time in this class? The gap. What? And velocity equals distance over time. Okay, velocity equals distance over time. Um, see, that'd be a good way to describe this to you know, the people that have the first course. We take this equation and make it terribly difficult. <laughs> Velocity equals distance over time. So if I want to know time, what's the equation? Rearrange it. So this is distance over velocity. Distance over velocity. So how much time does this take? What do you got? The distance divided by the speed of the light. Okay. Which is what that was something five minutes ago? I don't know. You're talking through your hand. I didn't hear it in any case. Alright, so I'm going to say the time later when the light gets there. The change in time is going to equal. I said it's not moving. H over C. Now, what'd you say? It's going to stop moving. What's not moving? The ship. The ship is moving. So how does that change things? Red ship, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then it, it doesn't change things. Why does it or doesn't it? Because it's light. Ah. Speed doesn't. Light always goes the same speed. No matter what. But I'm going to grab the dust factor. Okay, so. Perfect. I like that you guys trust okay. nothing. <laughs> 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 page okay, so now, based on what we've learned thus far, let's accept the principle that no matter what, now that's the neat thing about Einstein, all these things he keeps coming up with, um, they all work together. Einstein is one of his postulates when he started his special relativity. He said the speed of light moves at C no matter what. So we're going to stick with that. Now, the source, even though, so from this point of view, if they see this distance h, they're going to say the amount of time that it takes for go here is h over c. And they don't give a damn if the spacecraft has moved, which we're going to show that it has. So now the spacecraft is up here. We've got our light source here, which I'll try not to make look like a cat. How is it a cat? Did it have legs? Is this like an upside down cat? Like falling? Or is this not what you thought was a cat? Is this a cat? cat? It looks oh, like a thruster cat. now. Yeah. Well, I thought it was a good person. It's Fine. because you can't see the legs. All right, now it has to get them. <laughs> Except for it still has legs down here. Yeah, but you can't see them. It's a human like habitat. Habitat. It's a furry. Girl. All right. No. <laughs> yeah, what? First thing I want to say it's like a, thr like a thruster. Wait, what? It's like a thruster. Looks like a thruster, this thing? No, it's a thing of the Oh, thruster. Okay. Yeah, well, it's going the wrong way, so it doesn't work, it doesn't work out too well. So, we didn't say it was going up. Yeah, that's true. It's a very badly designed engine. Okay, so here we go. And at a given time later, we're going to say the amount of time is equal to h over c. And it doesn't matter because c always moves at that speed. Now, what about the velocity? Let's go ahead and assume that initially we're moving at 0 meters per second. How do I calculate what my velocity is here? Acceleration times time. No! What's the wait? What? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I was thinking of it a different way. All right. We could say that the definition of acceleration change acceleration is our change in velocity in the y direction over the change in time, such that a y times the change in time equals our change in velocity. If we started at zero, we could say that this is our velocity final where we're at. And I do apologize, Jared, for saying no. You are correct. The acceleration times the change in time. That's what our velocity is going to be in this direction. Awesome. Okay, now, what our time we're saying that has gone by is h over c. Okay, so I can say that the velocity of this spacecraft is going to be equal to a times h over c. That will be the velocity of the spacecraft for any given amount of time that it takes us to do this. Again, who cares thus far? 
Nothing has been violated. We just say spacecraft going. Now this is the speed that it's going. What difference does it make? There's a reason. Now we say. Now let's take this as a different example. Ooh, you can't see it over there. Okay. Let's say we're here on Earth, and we see a spacecraft that is taking off this direction, and flashes light towards us. Okay. Okay. So it's got a blinking light, and it's coming this direction. The spacecraft is going the other way with some velocity v, like that. If that's the case, we will show that the Doppler shift for this light, the observer, is going to be equal to f source times 1 minus v over c over 1 plus v over c. That is the frequency that we would see. Now, this is just for an object that was moving away. But let's think about it from here. Now, we see an, uh, a light pass, and it's going to move C no matter what from our point of view. Okay? Great. That being said, we are aware of the fact that we've got some sort of velocity that we are moving away, that we are moving away from it. So we see this flash of light going, and we know that this is moving at that certain amount of C that it's taking uh, to get here, and we know the distance between us, except for we're now saying that we have a velocity that we are traveling in this direction. So we are still going to have potentially a Doppler shift in this light. Okay. Because it would, from our point of view, we're now up here seeing it move at sea, but we know that it was launched down here. We saw that when we moved the other so direction. We should have like a crazy acceleration for this to happen, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. For this to even be worthwhile yeah. in this light. Again, we'd have to have an acceleration such that we'd be moving fractions of the speed of light and fractions of a second and, and ridiculous things. But by the end of today, things won't be ridiculous. They'll be very, very practical. In fact, by the end of the day, you guys have just made yourselves uh, much, much more employable, presuming you understand anything I said today. And I'll explain why. Uh, you better have an explanation. What? You better have an explanation. No, I'm serious about this. People more that can understand these two. concepts. What? More employable than who? Um, uh, Raytheon is a really good one if you really want to work for them. Uh, Siemens is another good company. Um, and actually, DirecTV, they're a great company if you want to work for them. Uh, as a physics major or minor who can demonstrate abilities to understand general relativity and why that company needs to know it, you're extremely employable. Okay. So stay with me. So, so if I don't want to do any of that, <laughs> um, then you take so this question for your test. So. <laughs> and you understand it so that you can answer the question that's going to be on our test next year. Fair enough. All right. So, I forgot to put the one half right here. So, I can rewrite this equation. Now, we're going to simplify this. This is the equation that we came up with a couple weeks ago. We are going to simplify this in a few different ways. F observed is going to equal F source times the quantity 1 minus v over c to the 1 half power times 1 plus v over c to the minus 1 half power. Now, do, do you see what I did, though? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there's nothing new. I haven't changed anything. I've made no assumptions on this. All I did is move the denominator off to the side. Now, we are going to use, as we have already half a dozen times, the binomial approximation, the VA equation. Anybody remember what that was? We said if we have a quantity, 1 plus x, 2d m, is equal to what, approximately? Uh, 1 plus nx. There you go. We can say this is equal to 1 plus mx. All right. Now, this is exactly true for any times that m is much less than 1, any time that n is a small quantity. So this is where this is starting to get interesting and where it gets practical. Now, all of a sudden, we can say that this Doppler shift equation, as we're going to change it, is still going to be valid for things where v over c is small, where we don't actually have to be moving that fast to still see a slight Doppler shift. We know this because we see planets that are moving away from us, and we can see a slight Doppler shift. So this equation still becomes valid. So I can now rewrite this as f observed is equal to f source 1 minus 1 half v over c times 1 minus 1 half v over c. Thanks to the Doppler approximation, we can say that these two quantities are the exact same as multiplied by each other. Fancy trick how that happened. It's called oh. Doppler uh, approximation. 
No, this is the binomial approximation as applied to the uh, relative Doppler shift equation. They do these fancy phrases. So I can just say magic. You can say magic on that too. I like to give you guys the big phrases so you can press your friends and say that, you know, we use the binomial approximation to apply to the relative, relativistic Doppler shift equation to simplify things. All right, let's multiply this out. Okay, what is this going to equal other than a whole bunch of stuff? Um, okay, move me, please. Okay. 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 Minus one C minus two one halves B over C minus B squared over C squared. Okay. That's what we get inside there. Every We're getting zero off every hand. You said the chain is the first half. This is the easiest one. And you better, we're, we're building up to the TV, you won't understand this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make more portable. Be on TV, yeah. I didn't say that. Oh, you make better TV. What? More you say about TV. Direct more employable. TV. Oh, direct TV. Yes, more employable. All right, now, we want to talk about very small velocities. So the whole point we could use this in the first place is that V over C is small. Oh, wait, I did this slightly wrong. Um, over 4 C squared. So we're still going to have that one half term that's going to stick around. All right, so if V over C is a small quantity, v squared over 4c squared is stupid small, okay? So we can go ahead and not even count this term. It's going to be negligible. And then we're going to end up with, in this equation, f observed is equal to f source times the quantity 1 minus v over c. Nice and simple. <laughs> now, you can use this for any velocity. Now, when would you want to use this version versus this version? So, so that's when the velocity is small, and then that was when it was closest to the left. Right. Now, if we had more time, which in hindsight, if I thought about this, I would have made this a homework assignment. I would have had to calculate this for the speed of light for 0.01. Uh, wait. Yes, 0 0.01 the speed of light using these two equations, and for 0.8 the speed of light. You would see at 0.8 the speed of light, we need to use this equation. We're going to see a large shift. At 0.01, we're not going to see any difference between this equation and that equation, which is the reason we can use this for slow moving objects, which we're going to look at. Okay. So that's like one of our homework assignments that we did. Yeah, where I asked you to show where gamma v was upwards of 1%, so where the difference is. Part of upper level physics is learning when you can use approximations and when yeah, you can Yeah, that one was like, back to book had like 10 to like negative. Really, like percentage difference. Like I you can't even calculate that on the computer on the calculator. Oh, well, the percentage difference of I like, guess basically one point like nine zeros and one at before you had it. Yeah, at that point, if you ever need to use really long numbers, what I recommend is going on Wolfram Alpha because they can use even longer uh, precision and accuracy than any of the calculators can. They have a cell phone app too for that stuff. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. I've been trying to get the school to get a license for that stuff, but they don't do it. It's really unfortunate. I don't like that. No, I wonder whether or not I can get the library to get us a license for that. I have, they asked me, that we have four and a half grand of library funds to buy stuff from me. Oh, I need, Tell them either to let you buy that or that they okay. sit through this class. <laughs> Man, you make that sound so <laughs> This is such a lovely option. <laughs> It's like, would you like to be waterboarded or sit in Ross's modern business course? <laughs> Maybe you had to choose. I'll take waterboarding. Alright. Now, okay, why do we do this? Because, let's go back here, let's talk about the velocity of the object that we said we have. The acceleration due to gravity, and I should have put this in here, times h over c. So in fact, I can just write this as g h over c to be consistent with what the book said. What page are you on? Uh, I have no idea. 47. 47. Okay, no, I'm going to finish it up the board over here. Sorry, I wanted to. Uh, I've got a little bit of board left over here. All right, there we go. Okay, now with that information, I can now plug this in and I can say F observed is going to be approximately equal. Now, we need to say that all of this is approximately this point. <laughs> it just happened. I hope in the video I didn't pick something up. Uh, we'll find out. <laughs> Brad says the audio is not too great, so you might be lucky. <laughs> 1 minus gh over c squared. It's supposed to be g. Boy, that's an ugly g. Alright. 
and that's just applying it to the velocity that we have in this reference frame where our cat and or person is watching the light as it goes up. Now, we didn't include the... Where does the F source have? Yeah. Oh, right, times F source. <laughs> Sorry, I was just doing the part that parentheses. Okay, so, assuming that G, the acceleration due to gravity, is small, and this distance at H is always going to be small, this is not going to matter. The F observed is going to be pretty much exactly like source, unless we get to a really big G. Any ideas where we might find that? Close to the planets? Uh, not even planets and suns are not even going to be holes. Yeah, like Black holes. That's where this yeah, starts yeah. to get interesting. So, what happens for our F observed compared to our F source towards a black hole? Bigger what's first? Well, what happens to the frequency? The frequency, the frequency goes down to zero. So this is where the idea that we talk about black holes eat light comes from. Okay, and we're going to see that a little bit more here in a second. All right, so now let's go back to Earth. Now what we want to say is if this is true, we're going to say that we're going to see some sort of dilation, some sort of slightly different frequency. This person's going to be watching this object as we have the acceleration of this object going upwards like this. Okay. I'm really starting to wonder why my photometry needs modern physics. Because <laughs> it's fun. Unless I'm going to be working in a black hole or moving at speeds of light, I don't see Because this. he said we make a robot to you today. <laughs> Bring the meat. That's all. Okay, so I will embrace uh, and I'll be here in the middle. That'll work as well. I'll leave this equation over here on the right. Okay. Well, stuff migration is wrong anymore. I don't know. I don't think so. Are we there? All right. Now, same thing. I hope not. Do you really drop the shield? Now our humanoid furry can have a... That is a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can have a prehensile tail. All right. So this yeah, is a new example. example. New uh, example. But the whole point of what I want to talk about here is now what we're going to say is that there's an acceleration due to gravity that is pulling downwards like this. Is that Everything is pulling gravity? downward like this. Now, why does like this matter? What did you say? It looks like a muffin. It looks like a <laughs> hot coffee. A radioactive muffin. A radioactive yes. muffin. Oi. The yeah. light's being sucked away from it from black hole. I would understand modern physics if Dr. Ross could draw that. <laughs> that can be your excuse around later. Okay, now, class. what I want you guys to believe, I want to convince you, and this is at the bottom of 46, is that these two systems are identical. This gets back to the whole spacecraft that is going away and V, this person is taking off, is going to be the exact same situation as a person sitting here on Earth where there's an acceleration due to gravity downward, where everyone feels like they're being pulled downward. Whether the velocity is going up or the source is being pulled down, in either case, we're saying that these situations are identical. Okay. Now, if you can believe that, this is where things start to get really interesting. Are we on board with this? That these two situations are identical? Why? And if not, why or why not? What, we don't feel weightless. Or well, wouldn't that bottom not feel? No, we didn't say that you were feeling weightless in the first place. Now, here's the thing. If you're in a spacecraft and it's taking off with an acceleration upwards like this, you're going to feel like you're pushed down onto whatever you're on. So we're taking the spacecraft that was way out in the middle of nowhere, that was just sitting there floating. Okay? And this was, remember, okay, so let's back up. So especially for you, Brad. Now, we, when we started the class, we had this idea that we said that we had a cube. We have a person in the cube with a ball, and then we had a spacecraft like this. And we had Anna off in her spacecraft. She had a ball. The idea is, if you're pushed out of a plane on an elevator that you can't see out of it, you're falling, as far as you know, you are weightless. You throw the ball in the air, you're just moving around. Things will end badly for you in a short little while, but right now, physics is awesome and you're floating around. This is the identical situation to being in the spacecraft in the middle of freaking nowhere. I mean, redefine BFE. 
We're talking no planets are nearby to have any sort of gravitational effect on you at all. You toss the ball up in the air. It's an identical situation. Now, in what way can we now make that the, these two situations seem like gravity? This guy, we can let him slam into the ground. Okay, when he hits the ground, it's going to be this equivalent like here. He becomes a monkey, apparently. But the point being is now all the physics are based on the fact that he's still being pulled towards the ground with the acceleration of gravity. Now, how do we make this situation feel like there's gravity? The only way to do that is to accelerate up. So we have this acceleration, which we can take to be the acceleration of gravity, okay, as this person takes off upward, and this person's going to feel just like they were on Earth. As, this, as long as this thing keeps accelerating this way, they're going to be pushed down to the ground, just like feeling like a normal human. So if any of those advanced sci-fi movies or shows, such as Babylon 5, that's what they do. They show that you're always accelerating, or rotational acceleration equal to that of gravity, such that you feel like a normal human being. You know what I always thought would be interesting on those shows? Why don't they have a low gravity day or a high gravity day? It'd be a neat holiday, right? If you had a rotating ship, you could do it. So today's going to be half gravity day, just for the fun of it. You know, it's like casual Friday. It's low gravity Friday. You just float around. It'd be really cool. Or high gravity day. Like, oh, man. So like 20 minutes every day in the morning, it was high gravity, you know, day so that you could work out and whatnot. You could use your two-pound weight and you get pretty big and buff. What do you got? Then again, if you're in ships big enough, Change so your radius. How you far yeah, you have to, you could have a low gravity room and a high gravity room. Just depending on your radius. Yeah. So that would, it would matter quite a bit. In fact, if you're doing this, the rotating idea, we got a minute so I can do that. Uh, if you have this rotating room that was uh, gravity based, everything's going to be pushed outward. So you'd have to walk along it. The whole idea of uh, Babylon 5 is this thing was five and a half miles wide, was the ship. I mean, it was a huge, huge area. Um, so you'd have to walk around like this. So it would be one loop, and you would feel like that was all flat and all normal. So the point being is that um, as you went closer to the inner radius, would you feel more gravity or less gravity? Less. So the interesting thing about it is, think about playing basketball in a situation like that. The higher you jumped, the less the gravity you would feel. So if you were a bad jumper, you would barely be able to jump. If you were a good jumper, you'd be a phenomenal jumper. Because the higher you went, the less gravity would be. So if you were slam dunking, you wouldn't just be barely doing it, you'd be way the heck up there, and if you couldn't do it at all, you'd barely get off the ground. Hmm. So, it would be kind of Shooting interesting. a ball would be interesting. Shooting what? Shooting a ball would be interesting. Yes, yes it would. <laughs> Projectile motion would change, considerably. <laughs> 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 that would be very, very difficult. You would actually want to aim for low arcs, because if you arc it too long, well, damn it, come back. <laughs> 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 I probably would make them. Let's see, there you go. <laughs> Okay, um, about entertainment physics, okay, we'll have Nina try and throw the basketball up. In the event that it doesn't work, we'll just enjoy the experience. Alright. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so if we can believe that these two things are the same, the point being is that we showed that there's an F observed for, uh, is going to be equal to the F source based on this gravitational acceleration that we were saying that this ship was going upwards. Now, based on Einstein's postulate, the same thing has to happen here. This is where it starts to get weird. What we're saying is that the person who's standing here, just on Earth, a height difference of h up here, is going to see a different frequency than was emitted down here. Because there is a gravitational attraction. The system is being accelerated this way. The Earth is rotating. We are moving. We are constantly accelerating. There is a different observed frequency just by being a further radius away from the Earth than closer to the Earth. So it's going to be very slight. It's going to be very slight, but there is one. All right, uh, I think Drew had to say the first. That's means stuff like satellites. We're getting, getting there. Okay. Yes, yes, let's hold that belt. Yes. Well, I mean, how is the same difference in the gravity being different between the ground and Earth? What do you mean? Isn't the same concept as the gravity being different? I don't see what the. No, no, no. Gravity being different on different planets would affect this more or less. Okay. So let's see what ends up happening. Does the second term become positive? Does the second term become positive? What do you mean? Because so is it negative nine point eight, or is that because you have? A no, no, no. We're just uh, no. We're taking it still as a, a positive number. Okay. The acceleration. Now we'll get rid of that whole idea of the acceleration being negative. The only reason acceleration is negative in classical physics is because we like to treat down as negative and up as a positive higher numbers. Just use how we're thinking. Gravity isn't. A negative number per se. Okay. 
So now with that, what we can say is that um, if there's a frequency, frequency admitted here, okay, is this person going to see a higher or smaller frequency? Are they going to see a higher or lower wavelength? Lower which one? Sorry, they can't both be higher, yeah, they can't both be lower. A higher frequency corresponds to a lower wavelength, a higher wavelength corresponds to a lower frequency. Why? Because reasons. I'm going to go with the one that's higher. All right, well, let's just look over here. So, F observed. If we've got an F source of 500 hertz, okay, is the F observed going to be lower or higher? Lower. It's going to be lower. We're going to have a lower frequency, which means we're going to have a longer wavelength. So if it comes up like this, we're going to see a wavelength that is going to be longer. Bigger wavelength. A bigger wavelength, yes. So now we shift. What is the visual visual spectrum in wavelengths, approximately? Blue to red, but in wavelengths. Four hundred to seven hundred. It's actually quite convenient that it's pretty close on that. So For, we can see that. actually interesting thing about your eyes. You can see higher wavelengths than seven hundred. We're really bad at telling like seven hundred to like seven sixty. Uh, you can kind of see all that, and you can't tell the difference. It's all just that's a lot of red. Big, big red area. But if you look at the difference between, say, another 60 in between, say, uh, I don't know, 440 and 500, huge difference from our eyes. I mean, one of those is purple, then it went blue, then it went green. And so that's just the way our eyes work. So it wouldn't be a big enough gravity that we won't see the light, the black hole. Ah, because our wavelength goes to zero. Yeah, that gets interesting. So light can't escape. We're getting there. I'm saying that we can't see it. What? Like we can see the light without the Right, we, li we literally couldn't see, but so maybe the light holes really white or are perfectly white. Say again. The black holes really are black. They just look black, right? But the whole concept of a black hole, hole, by definition, is white. a gravitational pull that is so strong that light can't escape. So black holes seem like but protons are massless. What did you say? I think they're protons are ma massless, but they still can't escape. But it still doesn't matter. Even massless objects can't escape. So gravity, in that sense even affects light. That's the big thing the here. So, so far what we've seen is that we're seeing the observation of light just based on simple special relativity um, and the one principle that we said from the general relativity that we're saying that the two objects, the spacecraft here, on, or the elevator falling from the, the plane on Earth is the same as the spacecraft doing jack nothing in the middle of nowhere space. So that's why we start off with this ridiculous idea. If that's true, then we're saying just a light being observed here. If we're farther away, we're going to see a, a wavelength shift, a red shift. What do you got? Okay, so gravity affects light, but it changes the, it changes the frequency. It doesn't actually change the speed. Is that what I'm saying? It cha can't change the speed. It always moves at C. It does change the frequency. We're not done, so let's, let's keep going. Okay, so the point being is, let's take an example here. All right, well, let's take light at 600 nanometers. 600 man nanometers light. We use the same example you have in the your book. 600 nanometer light is what color, first of all? No, red. red. Who's John Ron What? Orange. Orange. Sorry, yes. I'm still going back to this. Okay, don't worry, we're going to see this. So, orange, so 600 nanometers. All right, that's going to be what, uh, well, let's not worry about it. To figure out how to, to reverse these. We could say that the speed of light to C is going to be the wavelength uh, divided by, or multiplied by our frequency. We can always say this, meters per second is equal to meters per second, wavelength times our frequency. So we can calculate our frequency and figure out that it's 5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Okay, so when light is emitted at 510 hertz, 5, uh, 5 times 10 to the 14 hertz, in one second, Okay, in one second, we're going to have 5 times 10 to the 14 wavefronts are going to be emitted by the source. I mean, that's the definition of a frequency of light, okay? You guys have all had wave theory with me. Okay, the point being that is from Bob's point of view, what is he going to see in one second, more or less of these? Yes, he is going to see less of these. Now, this is where it gets confusing. He is going to see less of these. So what has happened is there's a time dilation. 
between Bob standing up in here and this light source down here. There is a true time dilation without any velocity difference between Bob and the source. Zero velocity difference between them. And this is why this is called general relativity. Special relativity, you say, yes, if the object is moving with respect to one or the other near the speed of light, you say, okay, there's a velocity difference, there's a time difference. We had the hardest time just trying to consume that information. Now I'm telling you that there's a time difference here. So if this is the frequency difference, then the time difference, we can say the time t lower is going to be equal to change in time higher, 1 minus hg over c squared. Okay, It's going to be the inverse of the frequency, because time is the inverse of frequency. Okay, so time in this case is moving more slowly. Since the inverse. Say again? Since the inverse of it, but what changed? Nothing changed. One over, oh, uh, did I write this in correctly? Yes. Uh, the inverse, that's the same thing. Yeah, but I want to make sure that it. G H over C squared. No, because it's the higher, because they just switched it over from the other side. I haven't had it happy enough. No, because it's the change in time for the higher versus the lower. Um, so I wrote it right. They've just got it written the opposite sides. I'm going to teach it the same way that they had it here. So yes, the frequency is different, but the change in time, if you move this from one side to the other. In other words, um, this, the, the time, change in t higher. What do I mean by higher and lower? This makes sense. Here. Height. Height. Distance from the Earth. So in this case, the t lower would have been the uh, source, which is on this side of the equation, and the observed, which is over here, the time higher is Bob. That's why this can be on this side, because it's just so going to be over. Even if the object was up higher, we would still go with the T lower being the closest to the Earth? The closest to the Earth. It's not relative to the object or whatever? No, it's, it's not. Relative. It's relative to the close to the source of the gravitational center. Okay. So now, if we're looking at this, T, t lower. So let's say for one second, one of the goes. Just keep it in delta T source and delta T observation. Um, because it matters as to which one is closer to the center of the Earth. Our experiment, the way we set this up, is that the source is closer to the center of the Earth. That isn't necessarily always the case. Now, everything is going to be reversed when we look at this in the other direction, when we talk about the source pointing, we have the source pointing at us from the sky, down when we're down here. Does that make sense? So we have to generalize it to, we could say, close, when we say lower, we basically mean closer to the center of the Earth, closer to the object that has the gravitational now keep in mind, all of this is happening. Um, we can say that there's no relative velocity difference between these two, but that's not really true. Why? Can you repeat that again? There's no, we say that there's no velocity difference between these two objects, but that's not entirely true. Why is there a relative velocity uh, between... Okay, there is a relative velocity between me and all of you because I'm standing up and you guys are all sitting down right now. Or just a little bit closer to the center of gravity. Why does that matter though? Just the classical Newtonian mechanics. That's kind of the stronger pull. Can't put it into words. words. Think, no, think old school. Shut up for a second. Uh, think uh, elementary school on the merry go round. Yeah, it's a higher force. The farther you are away from the center, the faster you're going. The farther away you are from the center of rotation, the faster you're going. So there is actually a velocity difference between here and here. One that we can't just necessarily feel. Right, it's going to be very slightly. But it's going to be very slight. No, it's not negligible. That's where this gets interesting. It's not negligible at all. Um, <laughs> it would be nice if it was. So now let's take this example. T lower, one second. Is this going to be a higher or smaller number than that? Okay, so we're going to have something like 0.9999 seconds that have gone by out here. Okay, so time is moving more quickly uh, at a lower, um, a, a lower time versus out to where Bob's time. It takes a longer amount of time. In other words, for Bob to see all 5 times 10 to the 14 hertz, he has to wait more than one second for it to get there. Okay? Because of the force of gravity pulling the wavelength. Pulling it back. 
It's not, and it's, you can't really think of it as a, um, as a it's not pulling on the light at all, because light still moves at a constant C. That's why I don't have a job. <laughs> we're probably going to have to read over this section. Um, I'm not surprised that on our first attempt, we're not going to get through this. In fact, what I want to go through is I want to go through the example, and we haven't had a chance just yet, um, uh, the global positioning system at the bottom of 47, uh, which is good news for you, because that means that you only have to do one of these problems. Um, you know what? Since we're going to cover that first thing on, on Thursday, I'm going to hand this homework out. And we'll still say that everything's due on Tuesdays.